Hello and welcome to another edition of the Beyond Zero Show, recorded in the studios of 3CR and syndicated around Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast on the internet at bze.org.au and 3cr.org.au or whatever podcasting app you choose to use. G'day, my name is Matt Grantham and with me today is Anthony Daniel. How are you today, Anthony? I'm well, Matt. How are you going? Very good. And who have we, uh, who have we got lined up for today? Today we're going to be speaking to uh, Nicholas Bernhardt, who is the Managing Director of Green BizCheck, which is an online environmental certification tool for a variety of businesses. And uh, Sydney, sorry, Nick joins us from his home in Queensland. Is that right? It is. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Anthony. How are you guys? Good morning and uh, and welcome to the show, Nick. It's great to have you uh, on the line today. Thanks for taking your time, boys. I really appreciate it. No worries. We'd like to just get a little bit of background at the start, uh, Nick, as to how people got in the area of sustainability. So what's your story in terms of how you got involved here? Well, probably quite a different one because I literally had the perfect poster boy corporate career up until I went into the sort of sustainability industry. I I completed my MBA and then went straight into banking, uh, sharp suits and nice ties and worked in investment banking for 18 years, ended up as head of sales for a very large broker and then had my own investment banking career uh, company for about five years and then decided... It really wasn't that challenging and satisfying, and I always had a a keen interest in sustainability. And so together with a group of other business people, we looked at what was out there for businesses to uh, get engaged in this field, and that's where GreenBizCheck was born. It has to be said, though, that, you know, the sharp suits and the nice ties <laughs> aren't, the, aren't the complete preserve of bankers. You could probably still dress in them if you'd like, I, I'm, I'm guessing, but... For me, I've, I've worked in a bank uh, just for a short period of time and, and, uh, and I, people have passions and they have things that they're really interested in and they're really, um, uh, even if they don't do it as a job. But do you think that there are a lot of passionate people in the banking and in, in investment sphere or do you think a lot of them are motivated by perhaps the, the, the status or, or, or the money that's there? Well, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I can speak for myself and some of my colleagues that I've met over the years in, in banking, and I think it is uh, literally what you're driving at. It is all about the status, and uh, dare I say it, and I don't want to be controversial here, it is also about the money, because it is it's a very lucrative industry to be in. Um, and, and that hasn't changed over the years, despite the GFC and, and everything else that's connected with it. Um, we, we'd like to get a little bit of background, uh, if we could, on, on what you're doing now, specifically in terms of Green Biz. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that, uh, that company and what it is that you guys do? Sure. Green Biz Check, we sort of looked at what was out there because we're coming at it from a, from a very business-oriented and commercial angle. So we thought, well, what, what, what is out there to help businesses and guide businesses along the, the, the journey, which is sustainability? And we saw there was literally nothing at the stage that we were looking at it, and that was back in 2007. Uh, There was ISO 14001, which is more about processes and procedures, but there was nothing about what can a business physically do to improve their footprint or improve their efficiency, which is sort of pretty much the same thing. Uh, And that's where we started developing the Green Biz Check uh, program. And so uh, what are some of the sort of, you know, what what is a typical client that you might have and what what tools do you typically use to help them sort of manage their emissions or, or improve their environmental performance? Well, we had to look at something that didn't exist, and that was we needed to develop something that was accessible 24-7, that interacted with clients, and that was was something that really drove action within the organization. So we literally had to develop a software from scratch and provide this service in the cloud. So it wasn't going to be those glossy, fancy reports that a consultant might deliver We look at it once and then stick it back in the bookcase. It was more about here's something that you can refer to 24-7 with usable information and short and sharp actions that we recommend. And that covers anything from energy, water, waste, recycling, transportation, travel, supply chain, IT data center. So it's a very comprehensive cloud-based program that we developed. So, so how, how does it work when I, when I log in and I'm, I run a small business, say, and I log in and, and I'm, I'm getting, I'm putting in information, I guess, energy, water, waste uh, statistics, um, and maybe some other pertinent information that may normalize that information, like number of employees, floor space, that kind of stuff. Is, is the idea that I would enter that information um, 
on, on, a, on a regular basis as well as perhaps putting in some of the things I'm working on and then get some feedback from the software? Is that how it behaves? You're almost, you're almost there. It's, it's an annual certification program. So you go through an assessment where you answer a whole set of questions related to those areas that you just mentioned. And then you instantly receive a report based on your answers saying, okay, you're not very good in this section. We want you to improve, and this is how you improve it. And then you can track your progress by saying, okay, you've shown me how to do it, why I'm doing it, and you've given me some resources on how to implement that action. And you can say, okay, I've completed that action. And then that particular action gets ticked off. So you can take your time in implementing the actions you can be as quick or as slow as you like, and it, it, it always allows you to really track your progress. When we talk a lot about this, these, this kind of uh, reducing footprints inside organisations or really anywhere, but it's particularly in a work sort of environment, you, you're speaking about the, the, t- the two factors that you can focus on, one being the infrastructure, what can you, can you build or you know, retrofit in order to improve your performance, but also perhaps the, the behavioural aspects. A lot of people talk about, you know, people turning lights off, people doing things like that. Uh, how much do you focus on suggesting the, the, the behavioural side and, and is there a, a reliable way to, to track your, your performance in that regard? Really good question. Yeah, I, I mean, the structure of the, the building, that's sort of covered quite nicely by Green Star ratings or Neighbours. We're looking predominantly at the behavioral side because we found that a lot of the action that can be had and the resources to be saved is within behavior. And you mentioned yourself turning off lights, turning off IT uh, systems overnight and at weekends. There's a big bang for your buck if you just do some really simple basic things. And our program tries to bring all of those simple basic things together in one really clear program. And I guess it's the interaction between the two as well. We spoke to a gentleman, I think quite a while ago now, who was involved a lot with uh, building performance. And his interest was really in saying, well, if you're paying a bit of attention to your building performance, you can actually get a lot of gains out of it. So it's not just about necessarily having the behavioral aspect, but also having perhaps some infrastructure and technology in place that then enables you to apply um, a behavior change to, to really get some real bang for buck. Exactly. And I couldn't agree with you more. A perfect example is switching off your computers at night when you leave. That, that's something that most people should be doing. Not many actually do it. And what you have there is you might have a technical assistance that you have a software program running in the background that just powers down all the non-active computers. So that, that can help that behavioral change. And people say, oh, okay, now my, my PC switched off and shut down. And the reason for it we want to save energy and, and make this planet a little bit a safer place to be on for the for future generations. You mentioned there one of those things about software that shuts uh, shuts down uh, so that you save power overnight. What are some of the specific tools that you guys have got available? You know, you mentioned that one, but what are some of the, the, the big tools you've got available that actually can help um, people to, to facilitate this and and, uh, and reduce their footprint? Well, well the, the program's built, been built as follows that it really is, it helps a business based on their responses to find solutions that are suitable for them. So we've, we've got a whole sort of almost decision tree behind the program that says, okay, if you are in situation A and you want to get to B, this is how you get to it. So there's, there's a lot of um, information on IT, and that's, for instance, the power shutdown uh, saving programs, or there's about energy efficiency in lighting. There's also a huge section on aircon, which is also a huge energy guzzler for most companies. So it covers in quite a lot of detail areas that a business, based on their responses, can improve on. Um, and, and maybe what you're looking for here is sort of what, what are examples of, of companies that um, have implemented certain actions. And I, I can probably relate two case studies here. One was a law firm, and I'm not sure whether I should mention names here, your call on that one. But it was a, a very large law firm, Brisbane-based, 140 staff. Uh, they had the software to power down their IT, but they hadn't... Uh, activated that software. So they had it installed but didn't activate it. So they were still running their IT system 24-7. We discovered that with our survey or assessment, and they saved 38% of the electricity within the first six months by just powering down their IT overnight and at weekends. 
That's a fairly low-hanging piece of fruit, that one, Nick. Totally. <laughs> you managed to find there. God, definitely, but I mean, the number, 38%, <laughs> is huge. And then we had another company, and this one I'll definitely mention, Resources for Profit, a small organization uh, that said, okay, we want to look at this as a three-year plan. And they looked at all the little 1% improvement solutions, we call them. And they implemented roughly about 30 of those. And then over two years, they save 43% of the electricity. And it really is that simple. Yeah, that, that is incredible. I mean, I mean, but I think one of the things that would perhaps frustrate somebody inside an organisation who's really passionate about, say, the environment and climate change is that, that so many of the emissions are, are in the supply chain. So, I mean, I can do a lot within my organisation. I can reduce my energy use, reduce my waste. But at the end of the day, if I'm in an office in anywhere in Australia, if I have a light on or a computer on at any time, I am partaking in some coal or some gas being burned somewhere to make it all happen. And of course, yes, I can reduce my, my impact as much as I can, but so much of the environmental damage is there embedded into the supply chain. So how can, how can what you do inside an organisation also then have application outside? Really good question. I think that's where you're talking about how many people feel powerless because they think, hang on, what's my contribution going to change? It's not going to change anything. But I guess if everyone, if the 7.3 billion people on this planet and counting thought that way, then we wouldn't have a hope in, in, I won't mention the word, but we wouldn't have a lot of hope for the planet being the way it is in the, in the foreseeable future. So I guess... We all have to change the way we act without even changing our lifestyle, just being a bit more sensible and reasonable about our energy um, consumption. But I guess by being part of this movement and being more efficient, you can drive change at other organizations for other organizations to also then say, okay, we've got to review what we are doing. And then that drives the whole sort of movement of let's be a little bit more smart with the energy that we're wasting at this point in time. Let's be a bit more smart with the infrastructure, with supply chain. I guess it just triggers the discussions to a higher level. You're listening to the Beyond Zero show, and today we're talking to Nick Ber Bernhardt from Greenbiz Check, uh, and we're discussing uh, issues in relation to how people can reduce their, their carbon footprint. Uh, Nick, now, one of the other questions we'd like to move on, you, I, I saw uh, in some of the briefs and related to your company that there's, there's certain aspects of what you do involved in certification. Now, I know that it probably doesn't set a lot of hearts uh, alight in the uh, sustainability world that, that people are, are doing bits of paperwork, but it is really important. So, you know, how does this certification stuff work and, and, and how does it relate to, to the reduction of emissions? I'm glad you started out by it doesn't really set people on fire with certification. <laughs> that word is just not something that's really sexy, is it? It's just one of those words you go, ooh, certification. And I'll put in another word that may even scare more people off, but it shouldn't because I'll explain why. Paperwork. <laughs> Paperwork, we don't do any of that. It's all cloud-based. Oh, good. But there's another word, and that's before certification. That's called audit, and that really sends everyone running to the <laughs> Uh, so we, we, we looked at that concept as well, and we said, okay, audit certification, really something that most people are not passionate about. Let's be totally blunt about it. Standard audits are men or women running around in trench coat coats with clipboards, and it's, it's really clunky sometimes. And I'm saying this slightly tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> we thought, why don't we put in place a simple cloud-based um, interactive audit function between the certification body and the client. So it's actually fun. You just upload a photograph, you upload a document. So there's no paper exchanging hands. And it's almost a fun exercise to tick off a list of auditable items that we have recognized and identified and sending them to the certification body, which I have to uh, hasten to add is not us. We do not certify our clients. We've got a third party that does it for us. And they're, they're a company called Bureau Veritas. They're a French organization that operates globally. They've got, uh, and, and uh, you've probably never heard of this company, but when I tell you they've got 55,000 staff, you might be quite surprised you've never heard of them. But as you said earlier, they're in an industry that's not really at the top of everyone's mind. It's certification, it's audit, it's assurance, it's verification and the like. But huge companies, so they stand behind Greenbiz Check. They do the audit, a very simple, fun, cloud-based audit, and then they certify our clients once they've reached, once they've um, 
um, reconciled the audit documents with with their requirements. And and so, who do you provide these certifications for? For the clients that you work for, and and what what are sort of some of the typical certifications that we do, that you would do? Are they in relation to water, energy? What, like what level what level of coverage can you get from that certification? There's three levels. There's bronze, silver, and gold. So we, we look at uh, we look at the perfect company out there, and they would get a hundred percent score on the full assessment that we provide them with. And now we said, okay, if someone reaches seventy percent, then they qualify for bronze, eighty percent silver, and ninety percent gold. So you don't even have to be the absolute perfect company to get gold certification. So you've got that 10% grace from 90 to 100%. And quite frankly, even for my home office, I couldn't get to 100%. I got to 94%. And after that, I said, no, those are some actions for my business that I can't implement. So I still managed to reach gold, but I couldn't get to 100%. Literally impossible. But you've got three levels, all of which are, are really uh, good to reach. And they're challenging to reach those so bronze, silver, and gold. And would a client generally sign up with Green Biz Check, do their, do their checks and go, go through a process of improvement and then uh, pursue certification at a later stage? Would that be the general process it would take or would, it, would they try to get certification immediately? That's the general one. Some companies have, have gone right into it and said, okay, we want to get bronze within the first month of operating the Green Biz Check program. Others might take longer. And I guess you mentioned before the size of client and some examples. I'd say it's fair to say that the larger the client, the longer they will take to get to a certain level because it, it implies more change within the organization and dissemination of information to, to, to staff. So if you're a 10-man or 10-woman organization, it's a lot quicker to sort of implement actions than if you say a 2,000, 3,000 staff organization. And Nick, other than you know getting these certifications through this sort of third party that you mentioned in France, what are some of the, th- the benefits that clients get from certifying? I, I guess obviously what we discussed earlier, they will be saving money. I mean, it's undoubted if you do start being more efficient in your business, you are going to see some serious dollar savings. So that's critical. Then you get certification, which is another tool then to. Um, use for advertising, marketing, and PR, but also really critical these days if you're in the tender process game. So if you're applying for tenders, it is very important to stand out in those and having environmental certification quite often these days can be the trigger for you getting a tender or losing it. And uh, just so that we can sort of put some 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 numbers to some of this stuff, uh, Nick, just so that people got, and I know it's realised it's going to be different for different companies and, uh, you know, like the one that you mentioned before about enacting their software was a nice cheap um, cheap way to do things. But what is a typical re- return on investment for a process like this? You know, how much do clients save in terms of what they would invest in going through this process? Well, it, it, it really depends on the actual client, where they are in their sustainability journey. But suffice to say that there's, over 250 actions that we prescribe in our program. So literally every organization out there will find one or two really low-hanging fruits that they just haven't thought of in the past that will trigger immediate savings that will pay for the program twice, three times over easily already, just like that. So it's, it's, it's more about where is a company situated in the journey, but the savings with the, the actions that we prescribe, there's always savings to be had, and we've not found one client that has had to invest more than they gained by implementing some of the actions. Some actions obviously would entail um, an investment, but normally how we view those um, changes are that in the replacement cycle, you might start um, buying energy efficiency, energy efficient freezers or or fridges or PCs. So that's more in the replacement of your hard and software that you start looking at the the capital investments. Okay, well, let's talk a bit more about that stuff. I mean, obviously, part of the replacement cycle has a is an opportunity to go in a more energy efficient direction. Um, But I guess there may be scenarios where that's not it's it's you know the the return on investment may be there, but it, the payback period isn't within a couple of years and couldn't probably be be funded within the, the general um, business cycle. 
uh, what kinds of approaches do you suggest that, that companies take with something that would require more of an investment, something like you know insulation, perhaps even solar panels, those kinds of things, where the, the payback may not be immediate, but will have a lot of um, a lot of effects on on their on getting to that that next level, maybe getting from that silver to, to gold. Um, what kinds of approaches do, do your clients generally take? It's a really good question because I, I guess what you're driving at is here that most of the corporate world now is operating on a very short-term sort of vision and view. So we're, we're going from quarterly profit to quarterly profit almost. And so what lies three years ahead is not that significant for for the CEO or, or, or the board. So the, the way we try and drive that particular change is to make sustainability literally part of the company's culture, that they say, okay, well, it actually makes sense in for the business as an entity for the next 10 years that we implement those actions, even if we don't see the immediate short-term benefits. And, and I totally agree with what you said. It is a bigger challenge getting those those bigger investments across the line because everything is a little bit short-term driven at this point in time. So it's a really good point. There's no silver bullet there, actually. It's it's more uh, the, almost an educational uh, aspect of the program that we deliver as well. Is it not just the educational as, um, process for the client themselves, but also perhaps where they would get finance? I mean, one thing that comes through in, in the interviews we do in terms of, say, getting more solar on people's roofs is is the innovations in financing in terms of the, the, the banking side and, and, and that really being able to understand this as an asset class and understand how there is the return on investment. Is it not just the clients? Is it also the people that may you know, lend them the money to do this stuff? Oh, definitely. I think there needs to be a, a, a shift there as well, that it is uh, easy. And there are quite a few systems or programs out there. Quite a few of the banks have engaged in this, but I think we've still got a long way to go in in that area as well. And I think that's a really good point that that, that, that needs to change as well over time. Do you see your product evolving, uh, Nick, to, to start to bring in more partners and so that you start to really, you know, as, as, the, as the, this, this we've, we've interviewed uh, Danny Kennedy, for example, talking about some of the financing stuff on this show before, do you see yourself, um, when you find a problem with a, a particular um, client that you're working with, start to line them up with other partners that might be able to deliver that solution to the particular problem that they're facing? Definitely, definitely. That, that's part of the program, actually. I mean, we've got one particular organization that we've been working with for four years now, and that's Staples. They're the world's, world's largest office supply company. They've got a what they call a green range, and th- this particular green range um, ticks certain boxes. It is much more sustainable than any equivalent product out there. And so what we do is a lot of the clients we talk to obviously need office supplies, and we direct them to Staples and say, look, they have the most sustainable supply of office supplies, so you might want to check out their, their um, range or their collection. So that's, that's one of the elements. And we're more than happy to sit down with other partners and say, okay, you've got a solution in that field that can help our clients. Let's try and work together in driving this change. And Beyond Zero Emissions uh, recently um uh, released their buildings plan and as part of that there is a new uh, partnership that has been put together t- for a lot of these companies who are involved in doing retrofits and those kinds of things that the building plan uh, brings forward can actually interact and develop so I think uh, one thing that um, listeners may be interested in is, is seeing how that co- how people who are not just um, working with cust- with clients to, to reduce their impacts but also companies that that can actually reduce and, and help in a technical sense are really getting together and making that happen and it's good to see that that rise up um, is there, are there any sort of formalized uh, groups like that that you're aware of um, not at this point in time but that's something that we are working on uh, and to be more than happy to sit together sit down with beyond zero as well and see okay how could we sort of tie it all in together because I think uh, and you've mentioned that before I think that is one of the challenges as well that sustainability is such a big almost overpowering word for most people that they just say oh no too hard they put it in the too hard basket but if we can deliver a really clear and easy solution for clients and 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 the like 
that will make it much easier and it will make it much more palatable for them to say, okay, now we're ready to engage in it because it is that easy. And it's bringing all those pieces together. So we're more than happy to uh, start any discussions uh, with anyone on, on that front at this point in time. Nick, it's, uh, in terms of the sort of size of companies that you deal with, and obviously there's going to be different industries that are going to be sort of uh, more, less sustainable than others, but uh, is there a sort of, a sort of an optimal size of a company that you might work with that, that really where they get a lot of value out of, out of working with someone like you? Is there a sort of an optimum size for, in terms of you mentioned a law firm or Staples, is there, is there, is there sort of a specific size of a company that would really benefit from, from what you do? Our experience so far has been that the, any company with 10 plus staff, that works really well for the, it works really well for the Greenbiz Check, all the way up to a multinational with multiple sites, because our program is very good at doing multi-site assessments as well. So if you've got 20 different sites throughout Australia, we'll do an assessment for every single site, so they get their individual reports. So anywhere up above the 2,000, 4,000, 10,000 staff, that's a really efficient way of, of looking at sustainability for an organization. What we have seen, and that this is probably may not come as a surprise, is that the micro-business level is challenged anyway on a day-to-day -day basis that sustainability is very low on their agenda, and that's something we found for the micro-businesses, one to five employees or family-owned businesses. They seem to struggle with the concept because I think they've got a 24-7 uh, job on their hands, literally keeping the business afloat. Uh, and I'm not being disrespectful to micro-businesses. I think that's been the hardest area to break into. Okay, I think that's where we'll have to leave it, uh, Nick. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Anthony. Is there a website that people can find more information about your, your business? Sure, it's www.greenbizcheck.com. If anyone would like to send us an email, it's info at greenbizcheck.com. All right, thank thanks you very, very much. much, Nick. Thanks very much, gentlemen.